Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. I do want to encourage you, if you are making travel plans, to remember johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline affiliate link. You get all the benefits of going through Priceline.com and uh, being able to save on hotels, rental cars, airline tickets, and even more. Part of your purchase price supports the great detectives of old-time radio at no additional cost to you. So remember, when making travel plans, check johnnydollarair.com first. Well, now it's time to get into this week's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. And I do have to warn you that this uh, week's episode doesn't have the best sound quality. I'm sure Andrew Rons uh, will do the best he can with it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, this one will have a few audio difficulties, but it's, you know, listenable. Uh, the original air date, December the 1st, 1953, and the title is The Monopoly Matter. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. This is Maud, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Brandt just stepped into the office. Oh, good. I'll connect you. Hello, Johnny. I'm sorry I was out when you called, Mr. Brandt. Your secretary mentioned a fire you wanted me to look into. Yeah, that's right. We got the report about a half hour ago. If you hurry, you can be there when the fire inspector decides the cause. How serious is it? I don't know. I couldn't learn whether anybody was in the building or not. It's a recreation club on the outskirts of Waterbury. The Monopoly, Trent Street. Okay, Mr. Brandt. I'll take a run out and let you know what I find. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of a man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat... Chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Corinthian All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the monopoly matter. Expense account item one, $26.70. Car rental and mileage between my Hartford apartment and what was left of the Monopoly Club in Waterbury. company that covers this place, huh? Are you carrying credentials? Yeah. Same? Yeah. 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 Okay, here. Yeah. You have to be careful. 
Has the fire inspector shown up yet? Yeah. Uh, uh, that's him over there. The one walking away from the two men. Captain McCready. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Hey, Mike. Back over here. Captain McCready? Yes. My name is Dollar. I've been hired by the insurance company to investigate the fire. Come along. The men who answered the call at first told me it broke out inside on the ground floor. Anybody in the building? Not that we know of. No report of anybody. Now, let's see. The window is over there. The smoke was reported coming out of there first. Uh, Albert! Yes, sir. Have a couple of men bring axes over here, William. Yes, sir. Timber. Do you specialize in fire cases, Mr. Dollar? No, but I've worked with you. Well, here we have a new building, not over five or six years old, that had passed all fire inspections when it got a license to operate as a place of public assembly. What do you want, Mr. Oh, uh, you'll find some stash weights over there at the base of the wall. That's where a window was. Here's the debris down to the cement in a triangle, but that is the point. Spreading this way. Yes. You're looking for anything special, Captain? Point of origin. Smoke was spotted first coming out the window. Was it open? And if so, why? Yeah, it's cold weather like this. Was the club operating? No. It didn't open until 2 in the afternoon. We got the alarm at 11 a.m. Mm-hmm. You know anything about this Gerald Hobson who owns the place? Nothing yet. He was here, but before I was, he went home. Let's go over here and see what the men find, if anything. What we found pointed without a doubt to arson. Bits of broken bottles, the remnants of unburned cloth. Charred as the evidence was, the cause of the fire was fairly obvious. We used to call them Molotov cocktails. Bottles filled with gasoline or oil and a piece of cloth for a wick. One or more evidently had been thrown in through the window. And the damage to the frame building was over 90%. The closest neighboring building was a garage almost 100 yards away. We questioned the people there, and then Captain McCready went back to his office. I looked up the owner of the Monopoly Club, Mr. Gerald Hobson. From the insurance company? Yes, uh, looking into the cause of the fire. Oh, of course. Well, come in. Thanks. Uh, May I take your call? Oh, I won't be here long. I'll keep it up. Well, just, just come to the other room and sit down. I looked for you out at your building, but I guess you'd left before I got there. Yes, I I was there, of course. Bob at the garage, he called me about the fire. He's the one that reported it. Yes, I talked with him. And I went right out, but my nerves aren't what they were once. Fire is such a terrible thing. I, I didn't know what to do when I asked one of the firemen off, and he told me to go home. That people want to know where to find me. Uh, did they save anything? Nothing but the foundations and some plumbing. Oh. Well, then thank heaven for the insurance. <laughs> well, uh, I don't suppose you share my feeling about that. You've paid the premiums, Mr. Hobson. Now, uh, I'd like you to answer some questions about your club. Yes, of course. I, don't... I understand it was a licensed place of public amusement. What kind of amusement? Well, we specialized in monopoly. In what? Uh, the game, you know. Oh, sure. Well, we have a great many factory workers in Waterbury, but I started the monopoly club almost, oh, almost three years ago. To offer them harmless entertainment and relaxation. The game was quite popular. <laughs> Enabled them to play the financier, you know. Oh, yeah, I remember the game. But you buy and sell and try to amass a fortune. We ran month long tournaments and. Oh, I tell you, some of the fortunes were astronomical. Well, it was just bands. <laughs> was there any other amusement offered? Well, I had a few tables for the card players. There were soft drinks and candies. And... Mr. Hobson. I want you to understand that I'm not a police officer. Anything you tell me will be kept in confidence. Oh, yes, of course. Did you run any gambling games? Why, of course not. My club was a decent legal establishment. The members were good, everyday working people. And your income came solely from memberships? From memberships and retail sales. Uh, I don't like your informations. Not one bit. I'm looking for a reason why somebody should have set fire to your sure. building. That's why the gambling possibility crossed my mind. Heavy losses could drive somebody to it. Yes. You were absolutely sure that the fire was not accidental? The fire inspector, Captain McGreedy, seemed entirely satisfied. I saw the evidence, too. Uh, have you spoken to the police about this, Mr. Dollar? I know I haven't. Why do you ask? Well, a man came to see me a week before last. On Monday, it wasn't. I was just opening up the club, and so I was the only one there. It was one of those protection rackets. 
And he demanded money and made threats. You told the police about it? Of course, immediately. What did you say to this well, man? Well, I gave him $100 to get rid of him. That was to be the fee per month. As he put it, I'd better cooperate and keep my mouth shut or he'd put me out of business for good. Well, did the police come to see him? Yes, two officers came right out to the club. I told them I'd rather meet them someplace else, but they said the faster they got on his trail, the quicker they'd find him. Well, they didn't find him at all. And if somebody threw gasoline into my place, it stands to reason that that, that man must be the one. Mm-hmm. Well, if you let me use your phone, Mr. Hobson, I'll call Captain McCready. We'll see what we can make out of this. Yes, of course. It's right out here in the hall. Yes? Oh. I'm sorry, I missed your phone call, Dollar, but I had a meeting with Chief Blair. Oh, it worked out fine, Captain. Gave me time for a sandwich. Good. Oh, uh, Sergeant Winnick of the police bunco squad came over. He just stepped out of the room for a moment. I'm naturally requesting an investigation from the city fire attorney, but now with the possibility of extortion, the police can start their own right away. That'll speed things up. Do you have anything else? Well, the lab isn't finished with the evidence yet, but so far there are traces of three bodies... Captain. Oh, uh, Sergeant Winnick, this is Mr. Dollar. How are you, Sergeant? Nice to know you, Mr. Dollar. Now sit down. You, uh, you talked to this Mr. Hobson? Yeah. How did the subject of this man and his threat come up? When I told him how the fire started. Hmm. I don't know what to make of it. When he got out the report on that call we made at his club, two of our men were there 15 minutes after he phoned. And Hobson's description of the man had been radioed to every squad car on the streets. You didn't get any place, huh? No. We haven't had a complaint from anybody else in town on anything like it. If a protection racket was building, you think we'd get more than one call, wouldn't you? You think Hobson's report was untrue, then? We closed the investigation on the theory that a tranche had taken for a hundred bucks on a protection scam. Now I'm... I'm not so sure. You haven't checked on Hobson? Not yet. But I think we should. I'd be glad to have you along. Oh, thanks. Then I guess we don't have to take up any more of the captain's time. Arson cases are among the toughest to crack. You're faced with the fact that the fire usually destroys the implicating evidence. But there was some evidence that the fire could not destroy. I faced Gerald Hobson with it that night. Well, it was nice of you to come back, Mr. Dollar, to trouble yourself like this. You probably won't appreciate it when you've heard me out. Was that so? Why not? Well, to put it bluntly, you're under suspicion of setting the torch to your club. I'm in... Oh, are you out of your mind? What's the meaning of this? I spent most of the afternoon with the police. A Sergeant Winnick investigated your complaint a couple of weeks back. Your story of the protection threat didn't seem to hold up. Now, let me understand this... They think I was lying about that man? Oh, I don't think they'd say so. But well, they do, else. huh? Then why aren't they here? Because they're a lot more cautious than I am. Maybe I'm overstepping my bounds by coming, but I like to have things out in the open. I want to show you what's stacked up against you if you try to press a claim against the insurance company. Oh, yes, of course. I've forgotten your sole interest is in saving your company's money. Oh, yes, by hook or crook. I'll be your best witness if the situation clears up in your favor. But, uh, I did some snooping. I looked into some of your financial affairs. Get out of here! No. Sure, sure. This is your castle, Mr. Hobson. This kind of privacy I have no right to invade. But the fact that $18,000 would save your financial neck is not private information anymore. Well, that's where I left it and drove the 25 miles back to Hartford in my apartment. And that's where it stayed until the phone interrupted my first cup of coffee the next morning at 10.30. Johnny Dollar. Sergeant Winnick and Waterbury. Oh, yeah, Sergeant. What's new? Did you jump on Hobson last night like you said you were going to? Yeah, I needed a little. You should have saved it. The picture's changed. Hobson's story is on the level. Oh. Well, I've been wrong before. Another protection threat. About 20 minutes ago in a bowling alley at 783 Sheridan. It ended in a shooting. One man dead, another wounded. We 
You're coming over. I'll meet you there. Yeah. Thanks for the call, Sergeant. I'll get started right away. Friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Even when you're busy working, you can slip a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy that pleasant chewing. The lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint gum while you work, and at other times, too. Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Come on inside. The dead man was a bystander. They just took his body down. Yeah, the old timer over there is Conan Robleski. He owns the place. Shot one of the toughs. He's pretty upset. Yeah. The other one made a run. No, no, no. I am good man. Where is Officer Dubek? You don't have anything to worry about, Mr. Robleski. Who? Who is this? Uh, he's not a policeman. Uh, he's Mr. Dollar, a friend of mine. I'm sorry to hear about your trouble, Mr. Robleski. Oh, so much trouble in the world. Why they did this in my city? But I have right. I shoot this man, but I don't do wrong. Yeah, that's what I understand. They were threatening you, weren't they? They say I am foreigner. They say I pay them to work in my city. I say no. He say he fix my place like he fix some other. The Monopoly Club? Was that the name? Yes, I do not know this place, I tell him. They say, you stupid old man, you get burned down. Then my friend Carl come in. He say loud, what is? He knew something was wrong. Oh, he see me mad. They turn to him. I open drawer for gun. Carl come close to fight. Then this other, he has gun. And he shoot Carl. Then this other, he turned to me and I shoot. But the one that shot Carl got away. He run. Now they say Carl is dead for trying to help me. It's wrong, my friend, to be dead. Why this be? This be good world. Why so much trouble for people? Oh, why? That's about so it, much man. trouble for people. Yeah. Why, why, why? I take it they came in when he was opening up. Yeah, that's right. He was alone. I just found my conscience, man. The wounded man, was he conscious? Yeah, suffering from shock. So he wasn't with him, huh? According to his one of these, Paul Luna, who was dressed in Chicago, 21 years old. Anybody spot the other one? The newsboy across the street saw him come out and run south. Not much of a description, but it fit what Robleski gave us. Roads and railways ought to be covered by now. Yeah, they were stopping cars when I came in. Yeah, we're telling glasses in charge. <laughs> the old war horse can get things done in a hurry if he feels like it. I'm going to get that car to the middle of the street. Yeah. Uh, Luna's over at Central Emergency Hospital. We might as well go over there and wait till we can make a statement. They tell us you're strong enough to talk, Luna. Yeah, well, they told me to, but I don't see no reason to. You're doing plenty of talking in the bowling alley from what we hear. I don't remember. I don't blame him. Pushing an old man around like that must be something you'd really want to forget. No, no. Go start up a parish someplace, will you? How many times have you been arrested, Lord? What difference does that make? After hearing you blab while you were passed out, we want to see how many lies you'll tell now. I didn't pass. No, you just don't remember. You know what time it is now? I don't care what time it is. It's after four. You were out for over an hour. You don't bluff very good. Your wife's name is Edith. How's that for bluffing? 
Where is your wife? Oh, leave me alone. I hurt. The doctor said you were in good shape. It's a laugh. If you weren't, he wouldn't have let us in here. Where's your wife? I don't know. Look, you're wasting your time. I don't want to talk, and I won't. That old man you shot is dead. Did you know that? Shoot nobody. All right. I didn't have a gun. He was right there on the floor beside you. You're a dirty, stinking liar. I didn't have a gun. The guy that was with me, that was his gun. He shot the old man, and you know it. The report says you were there alone. That's a lie. Who was with you? The guy I teamed up with. I don't know his name. If you can prove that, it might make a difference. Can you prove it? It's true. That, that old guy, that Robleski, he knows it. He said you were alone. It's a lie. You're lying. If he said it, he's lying. Why should we lie? To frame me. I didn't kill him. Why should Robleski lie? I don't know, but he is. And if you guys want it, you can make him say he's lying. Maybe he wants to be sure somebody gets the electric chair for killing his friend. As long as we've got you, you're it. He knows I had a partner. My partner did most of the talk. Who was your partner? I don't know. Robleski says you talked to him. I didn't. I tell you, I didn't. Bert Lucas did the talking. Yes, but... Dirty Take it easy, Lona. You knew Lucas was with me. Now we know. Hello, well, Sergeant. Just a little more. Yeah. I'll get verification of Lucas' name and description over the radio office if you hang on here. Oh, Mr. Hobson, come on in. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. Well, that's all right. Come on in. You remember, Mr. Dollar? Oh, yes. I'll meet you in my office, Dollar. Yeah, I'll get there as fast as I can. Well, I owe you an apology, Mr. Hobson. Oh, no. no. Oh, please, no. It's your job to look into things. I I shouldn't have lost my temper. Thanks. Now, will you take a look at this man? Well, yeah. That's of course. Is he the one you gave the $100 to? No. No, I've never seen this man. You're sure? Yes, I'm positive. Did Lucas do the talking at the Monopoly Club, too, Lona? He didn't have to talk much with this jerk. Oh, no. Uh, never mind, Mr. Hudson. Who touched off the building? You or Lucas or both of you? What's the difference? I want to know. I don't see what difference it makes now, but we both did. We did it because this jerk Hobson here went to the cops. Bert should have squeezed 500 out of you, then we've been out of this town. Oh, that, that's all for now, Mr. Hobson. We'll call you down again when we pick up his partner. Well, that'll take some doing. Bert's still on his feet. I put him way out of your class. Oh, he's a vicious type of person. Yes, here, here this way. Oh, oh. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Yes? I will contact you later, Mr. Hobson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Yes, nurse. Thank you. Maybe you better take this call. I've been trying to reach Sergeant Winnick, but he's not in his office yet. Well, sure. What is it? It's Nona's wife. She wants to talk to somebody who's seen her husband. Oh? Where can I take it? Right over here. Okay. Hello? 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 Who is this? This is Johnny Dollar, Mrs. Loney. How, how is it? Oh, he's all right. He's going to make it fine. Oh, when did you see him? I just left him. We, uh, we talked about you. Where are you now, Mrs. Lowley? I was just down the street. I started out to come right down to see him when I read it, but when I got close, I, I got scared. Well, you have nothing to be afraid of, have you? People will ask me questions, and I'm not going to lie no more. You'll think it's wrong, but I know it's right. Of course it is. Did I meet you someplace? Oh, no. But if you'll wait outside the door for me, I won't have to talk to those men who don't care about anybody. I'll be there. I'm so mixed up, Mr. Dollar. I, I don't know what I'm thinking. But I always knew that something as bad as this was going to happen. I always knew when it happened, I'd have to do something. The fellow who was with him is named Bert Lucas. Yeah, we learned that. The police here phoned the police in Chicago and learned about him and about you. And about how you and your husband left. They weren't sure Bert Lucas was here. But we found out from your husband. Oh, I... I know where Bert Lucas is hiding. Where? I, I can't tell you by streets and roads, but in a car I could tell you how to drive there. How can you be sure he's there? He came by where we live after he got away from that trouble this morning. 
He didn't know Paul was hit. He said him and Paul got separated, and he was going out to that place that got burned down. The Monopoly Club? I'm killing him when I tell you this. Not necessarily, Mrs. Lawler. Yes, I am. He knows he killed that man. He told me so. He said he'd never give himself up, but I don't care. He's in a cellar out there. That's where he is. He's going to wait till dark, but he's in a cellar out there. We'll be hearing these cars. Any more might scare them up. Yeah. I think we better move in. I'll leave one man here with a searchlight in case we need him. Hi, Bernard. You have a Thompson? Two of them, I keep your gun. You know, it's dark. You may try to run for it. Leave one of your men here in case we need some light. Right. Hillary, get the search train on the wreckage and be ready if we need it. No, you've been here before, Donna. No, I haven't. I didn't spot any cellar. Mm-hmm. All right. Two Thompsons on each end. And we'll move straight in. Quickly until we get to the wreckage. He's on. The stairway to the cellar must be one of those two corners of the back wall there. Uh-huh. They must hear us by now. I'm going to give him a call. Lucas! Come on out, Lucas! Let's move forward. Really? He hit one of the American. Get down. Get down, brother. Really? He's hit, Sergeant? How bad? Really? Really? In the spell-off, Sergeant. He passed out. I saw the muzzle flashes, Sergeant. Back there. Where you can see that timber at an angle. Well, they thought it was farther to the left. Hillary! White! Burnett! Cover me! I... All right, Lucas! Come on out before you blast it out! He won't come out, Sergeant. He's in too deep to... There he goes! Lucas, stop! You'll lose him! Burnett, stop it! Expense account item two, $35.50, miscellaneous, food, extra mileage, etc., etc. Expense account total, $62.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends... Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. And we know that you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Gil Dowd with music by Eddie Dunstetter. 
Featured in tonight's cast were Sammy Hill, Bill Johnstone, Stacey Harris, Polly Bear, Herb Butterfield, Howard McNear, Joe Duvall, and Jeanette Nolan. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon, inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Well, it is incredible how quickly Monopoly took hold as this grand cultural institution. When this episode was released, Monopoly had only been out for 18 years. Yet the existence of this club was totally plausible. That just is its place in American life, you know, and the life of the world. I get reminded when I watch uh, British television or movies, often that Monopoly was introduced on both sides of the Atlantic. Though it's weird to hear them talking about it, uh, the British, because they have entirely different locations and, you know, even listening to, like, a Doctor Who audio drama and having uh, one of the characters say, do not pass go, do not collect 200 pounds. I'm like, no, 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 that's, that's not how it goes. I know it is the exact same game. You know, just different places, you know, and some different values because it's in the United Kingdom. I love a good game of Monopoly, and it's been forever since I've played one. It takes, you know, such a long time to play. Particularly when I'm playing, because I don't do negotiated settlements or forfeits. Now, I, when I was a kid, you know, if it took seven hours to uh, play a game of Monopoly, then so be it. We sat down to play the game. We're going to finish this thing. So I would love to go to the Monopoly Club if this thing actually exists. And, uh, though I think it would have trouble existing in real life under that name. Uh, though I'm sure somebody out here belongs to a Monopoly Club and will correct me. But it does seem like if you were running a commercial establishment that the folks at Pashbro... I said Parker Brothers initially, and I had to go and edit that because Hasbro owns the game. Although, I still remember it as Parker Brothers. <laughs> I have some issue with you using their trademark name for your club. Also, the poor sound quality on this episode really did come through in terms of the impact. I think particularly in the last scene where they were hunting down the killer, there was uh, a few reminders of some of the sound effects work that they do on those sort of scenes. But you didn't get any of the benefit of it because the sound quality was so poor. The good news is that uh, folks have found better quality encodes. Um, I think that... Uh, most of the encodes we've played all, since uh, we've started going back through uh, Johnny Dollar in 2020 have been better than uh, those that we played the first time through. So, I don't know, maybe the third time will be the charm with this episode. We'll have to see. Uh, the end part with the expense account, with the big miscellaneous, is a reminder of how the show kind of slowly starts to move away from the expense account as this big storytelling uh, device. Some things, you know, realistically would happen, but there's no way to make them entertaining or turn it into a theme of the episode. So there are a whole lot of episodes where miscellaneous is the only item you hear on the expense account other than perhaps travel. 
Now it is time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day, and I want to go ahead and thank Christine. Christine has been one of our Patreon supporters since August 2020, currently supporting us at the shameless level of $4 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for the support, Christine. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please be sure to rate and review it wherever you download your podcast from. Next Monday, we're going to be kicking off Sam Spade with a radio adaptation of the Maltese Falcon starring Humphrey Bogart. Then next Friday, we'll be back with another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But coming up tomorrow, we head out to Texas for a episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers where... Sheriff Lucifer's grandson Chad's out in the hall. Wants to know if he can see the old man. Uh, just for a minute, please, Mr. Sheriff. Well, I guess it won't hurt none. Come on. Thank you. Got a visitor for you, Lucifer. Grandson, Chad. No. Please don't let him in. I don't want to see him. Don't want to see nobody. Grandpa, we got to get you a lawyer or something. I don't want nothing. You go home. Don't talk to me. You just have a home and stay there. Make him go, Sheriff. Make him go. You know you ought to go. That old man may be right. I don't want to see you no how. Don't ever come here again. But, but Grandpa, you got to... Never mind, Chad, never mind. You get out like you said and go home. Come on. Sam, you'd better drive him out of town. Let him cut across the fields and through the hills to his place, but see that he stays off the highway when you leave him. Okay, Sheriff. Go ahead, Chad. Yes, sir. <laughs> Where does he live, Chad? Up in the hills, about four miles behind Redford. <laughs> I'd like to take a ride out to Redford's place. If there is going to be any trouble here, it won't come before dark. Besides, I'd like to talk to Chad. I'm going to catch Sam and ride with him. Yeah, I'll uh, see if I can stop him from the window. Sam? Yes, Sheriff? Wait a minute. Ranger's going to ride out with you. Okay. He's waiting, Jace. There's a deputy guard in the place out there, making sure nothing's touched until we get photographed. Good. Thanks. Mr. Ranger, what are you going out there for? I told the sheriff everything, sir. No need for you to be going out there. Maybe there's no need for you being behind those bars either, Lucifer. I'd like to make sure. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.